Fantastic. I think we'll start recording now. Here we go. Super. So um, welcome, Anna, and rapid review for policymakers. Thank you so much. And sorry for having to change the, the time today. I know your usual time is one o'clock. I've got an antenatal appointment that couldn't be shifted. Um, so, yeah, I've just seen in, t uh, in PowerPoint there's now a present in Teams button. So I'm going to press that and see if that works. I don't know if it is. I think nope. There we go. Can you see my slide? Not yet. Not yet. Let's see. <laughs> Normally I go share. Oh, something's <laughs> happening. It's doing yep. something. Perfect. So you can see them. Wonderful. Yep. That's great. And um, let me just check that it will change them as I hope. Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. OK, yes, yeah, so thanks very much for having me today. So today I'm going to speak about some work that we originally developed for the Scottish Government's Maternity Services Review. But we've since adapted that work for work we did with the Nursing and Midwifery Council, and now we're also looking at using it in a, another maternity services review. Um, so although it's kind of all around maternal and infant health, it could definitely be applied in other areas related to health and beyond. But today I'm going to focus on the um, approach we use with the Scottish Government. So as you're probably all aware, um, you know, since about the 90s, there's been acknowledgement that policy should be evidence based. Oh no, my slides aren't changing. It's not totally linking. Sorry, just bear with me a second. Um, the policy should be evidence based, but we know it doesn't always follow and there are gaps between evidence and policy and then on to practice as well. And this is the same in health, education, climate change, I think as well, we can probably all agree on as well at the moment. Um, so about 10 years ago, Jill Rutter did some work to try and work out why evidence wasn't getting into policy and she came up with supply and demand side barriers. And I think perhaps one of the biggest barriers is time. You know, academic research works on very different timelines to governments and policymakers. You know, as we know, large scale trials can take five, 10 years to develop, implement, interpret, and then go on and publish. And governments work on timescales very different to that. You know, a time of office is often five years, so there can often be a focus on quick fixes. Also, many policy issues don't really lend themselves to randomised controlled trials. They might not be feasible, appropriate or ethical. And even if they did lend themselves um, to trials, we don't just need evidence on effectiveness. We also need evidence on acceptability, context and feasibility. Um, Jill Rutter also spoke about demand side issues in that policymakers may not actually look for evidence for various reasons. A big one being that political decision making isn't always influenced by outcomes, it can be influenced by values instead. Um, they may also perceive that their research isn't relevant if it was carried out in a different population. And often the way it's written or presented isn't very accessible to policymakers. You know, we produce these huge reports that are hundreds of pages long. Yeah, OK, there is a small scientific summary, but, you know, for a busy policymaker, it's going to be hard for them to get their head around that. Um, also, there may also be a perception that evidence is inconsistent. You know, different papers have different findings. So the role of evidence synthesis in that. So as we know, systematic reviews are now widely used in health um, to help deal with issues around conflicting findings between studies. And they are potentially more accessible to policymakers. You know, a lot of them will have plain language summaries as part of them. However, they are not without issue or criticism. They can be very time consuming, often easily over a year and requiring a big team of people. And traditionally, they were more focused on effectiveness, which is often too narrow to answer any bigger policy questions. However, methods have now developed to look beyond effectiveness and even then they can still be time consuming and they may not really tell policymakers what they need to know. So one approach to deal with the, the time side issue is rapid reviews. However, we know they've been kicking about for a while now and despite that there still isn't really a consensus yet on what they may actually entail. 
Generally speaking, they may involve a range of methods designed to streamline the review process, such as maybe doing a less sophisticated search of only one or two databases, using highly processed evidence, such as reviews of reviews, restricting or omitting grey literature searching, having one person doing the, the screening, limiting the number of variables assessed, um, not doing any quality assessment. Um, so these are the sorts of things that can be done maybe to, to make it more quick, but that varies across these rapid reviews. So they, they remain kind of ill-defined and they do also run the risk of not being robust, which would undermine the whole point of evidence-based policy making. And this, even then, they still may not answer the questions that the policymakers want answered. So as I said to date, I'm going to focus on the approach we developed with the Scottish Government for their review of maternity services. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of background to how maternity services in Scotland are arranged and the background to the review itself. So Scotland differs from England a bit. We've got 14 health boards, but they're all it's just based on geography of where they are rather than on clinical services. So we've got 14 territorial boards and um, all women will see a midwife. Um, they may or may not see an obstetrician or other healthcare professionals. Obviously, Scotland varies quite a lot in its geography. So we've got remote and rural versus urban areas. And we've got very big variations in socioeconomic deprivation. And consequently, we've got a huge amount of variation in service provision in both neonatal and uh, maternity healthcare services. So this review, unlike a lot of the kind of maternity services reviews that are going on at the moment that you might have seen in the news, like the Ockenden and things, it wasn't in response to a specific adverse incident or event, but it was in response to kind of increasing recognition. The current services hadn't been developed with the needs of women and families, but were instead were developed around the needs of the service. And it, there was also a growing awareness that service provision varied hugely across Scotland and not just because of geographical reasons. Um, there's also huge inequalities in population health, comorbidities, obesity, alcohol and levels of breastfeeding, all of which impact on maternal and infant health. Also, this was back in 2016 we were doing this, there was an ongoing review of the English maternity services and the Scottish Government never really liked to be outdone by England. Okay, so Doing any research with government necessitates consideration of the policy context. So within Scotland at the time, there was a huge focus on tackling inequalities and reforming public sector services to empower communities and improving outcomes for the population. So there's a number of policies that we can to take into account. There was GERFEC, which you might have heard, it was quite controversial for various reasons, but that was the kind of national approach to improving outcomes for children and young people. Um, we also had realistic medicine as well, which seems to have gone by the wayside a little bit now, but that was about how to reduce overtreatment and unwanted variation in, in clinical outcomes as well. So the review structure, um, we had this executive group which was chaired um, not by, by someone that had a healthcare professional background, but she was not maternity healthcare by background um, and in the end there was over 100 staff service users who formed these review groups. So the review process started off with a kind of main review group of 23 members and this consisted of obstetricians, midwives, um, people working in kind of human resources as well, third sector organisation representatives too. And from these kind of this oversee this oversight group, four subgroups were formed. So the maternity and neonatal groups looked at existing service configuration and what were the current strengths and challenges facing the, the workforce of maternity and neonatal services. Um, and there was also the, the workforce group as well, which was kind of more the kind of HR side of things. Um, and these groups were underpinned by the evidence and data subgroup. Um, who provided them evidence the for, in the form of the reviews that we're going to discuss today. So the evidence and data subgroup was made up of academics like myself that had an interest in systematic review methodology 
as well as um, some healthcare professionals too. In addition to this, going on alongside it, there was a consultation exercise with service users. Um, so the chief executive of the review, she actually visited all 14 health boards across Scotland to meet staff. Um, and there was also five service user events across Scotland and an online questionnaire. So um, the evidence and data subgroup, as I said, that's where I was based. So we worked with the other three subgroups very carefully, very closely, sorry. So these three subgroups, the maternity, neonatal and workforce, they would meet regularly. And at these meetings, they initially came up with questions that they wanted evidence to help inform their work. Um, you can imagine that they came up with huge numbers of questions. Some were appropriate, some weren't. So we took these questions and considered their appropriateness. Sometimes we could join them up. Sometimes they were very specific kind of clinical things that might, you know, necessitate a kind of Cochrane review. Um, you know, whether one treatment was better than another for preeclampsia. That's not what we were looking at here. We were looking at how the services could be arranged. Um, so our remit was to identify the evidence to answer that question and provide it in a format that could then be used by the review groups, bearing in mind that they weren't mainly academics. And it was up to us to find out how to <coughs> sort of distill these questions and answer them very quickly. So initially we were given four months to do all this with the potential for a fifth month if necessary. So crucial to us was developing an approach to gathering and synthesizing the evidence that was robust as you know all this was going to inform provision over the next 10 years. Um, it had to be done quickly and looking at methods of evidence synthesis, rapid reviews <coughs> on their own didn't quite offer a suitable approach. And we were also looking at a very broad subject area, you know, not very specific clinical questions, as I was saying. So we had to consider actually what do we want to know from these reviews and what do the policymakers need to know from them? And we wanted to reduce kind of unwarranted variation across Scotland and service provision, we did need to be aware that different health boards do have different needs. You know, what's needed for women in Orkney is going to be a bit different for women in Glasgow. You can't have a, a, a tertiary level NICU in Orkney because there's just not the number of babies thankfully needing that. So what came out of our reviews did have to be applicable in different settings. So after a lot of discussion, we decided that what we really want to know, what are the core principles for developing maternity and neonatal services that are effective, equitable, safe and affordable? So I'm now going to talk about the different stages that we went through. And these could be applied elsewhere. So the first stage was developing a core review team. And I think this was crucial to us managing to um, complete the project, particularly managing to complete it in a, a reasonable time frame. So the, the core review team consisted of uh, myself and Professor Mary Renfrew, um, Dr. Uh, Mary Ross Davy and uh, Dr. Steve McGilvery. And um, Professor Mary Renfrew in particular was experienced in working with policymakers. So she was both experienced with that and also subject expert. She's also a very experienced systematic reviewer as well. Um, obviously, Mary Ross Davy, she worked um, for NHS Education Scotland, but is a midwife by background. Um, both myself and Steve are clinical by background. So we had some knowledge of maternity health care services, which I think was helpful for the process too, although not essential. So, yeah, we had a bit of overlap where um, everybody knew a bit about review methods and also a bit about maternity care, but we all had our expertise in, in different areas. So once we got the team together, um, the next stage was working out what these reviews were going to look like, what the questions were going to be. It was very much an iterative process that took quite a big chunk of our actual time. Um, these review groups gave us loads of questions, so we had to prioritise and determine what was appropriate and feasible. Um, I think, as I said before, some questions were very focused around specifics of 
an intervention and that's not what we were looking at so we had to keep bringing people back to the kind of core principles of how we organize services so for each review we identified what we called review sponsors so that was two people either um, clinicians or service user representatives that were more involved in each specific review to help develop the questions and the review itself. So we thought we were maybe on our way, <clears throat> but the aim of the Scottish Government was very much focused on developing a model of care for maternity services. It quickly became apparent that people in the different groups had different understandings of what this meant. So the first piece of work involved actually defining, well, what is a model of care? The maternity services group were very much focused on the location of care. You know, is it in the community? Are women having their babies at home? Or are they having them in an obstetric unit? And whether the care was midwife led or consultant led? Whereas the neonatal focus was very much on, was it family centered care or not family centered care? By family centred care, I mean care that involves the family as much as possible in the daily care of their, their newborn. So we defined that first and then we developed aims and questions for each review using a standardised format. And this was kind of key in helping us streamline the process and keeping consistent aims and questions for each review and keeping it kind of grounded in the fact that we were looking at core principles. So, um, yeah, these were the kind of standards or template questions that we used. It was around what is the model of care? How should it be organised? What do the people providing the care need to be able to do? And then we, once we kind of had that template sorted, we worked with the groups to prioritise the actual review topics. So in the end, we um, developed seven separate kind of rapid reviews based on the following topics. So there was um, how to provide care for women requiring um, maternity critical care services, how to provide care for infants requiring ne neonatal services, how to improve the care and services and outcomes for women and babies from vulnerable groups, how to improve interprofessional working, because you may not be surprised sometimes there can be issues between midwife to midwife, midwife to obstetrician, you know the list goes on and um, looking at continuity models of care, you know how to ensure that the woman sees the same care provider throughout her um, maternity journey and um, where the maternity care should be delivered including place of birth and um, how services are organised across the continue. So this is starting from antenatal care to birth care to, to postnatal care. So we had our, our topics that we were looking at and um, then we had to develop a protocol. So to try and ensure consistency and make it efficient, we developed a generic review protocol which could be applied as a template for all our different reviews. So in addition to obtaining traditional evidence on outcomes, you know, randomised controlled trials and well-conducted observational studies, we also wanted to get evidence that explored the opinions and experiences of stakeholders. So that was considered alongside kind of reviews on effectiveness when making recommendations. Because if something was found to be effective in changing outcomes, but not acceptable to stakeholders, this would be a problem if the government wouldn't be able to implement it very easily. So we used a hierarchical approach to identifying literature and prioritise highly processed literature in the form of high quality systematic reviews. Um, and we only sought primary studies when these weren't available. I'll speak a little bit more about this later. Sorry, I'm trying to change the slide here. There we go. So in our um, generic review protocol, we based it on a template produced by NICE and it contained all the standard things you would expect, you know, your inclusion, exclusion criteria, which we based around Peacock's um, search strategy um, and an approach to critical appraisal. And 
also it became quickly apparent that we probably needed some sort of predefined framework to help structure the analysis and synthesis. You know, we weren't going to be doing meta-analysis or anything like that, but we need to kind of think about how we were going to present the results um, and the sort of standard approaches weren't going to be appropriate given the broad focus of the topic. So we needed a framework to kind of hang everything to. Um, thankfully, there was a pre-existing framework around maternity care provision that was already available, and that was evidence-based. It was published in The Lancet back in 2014. So we used that framework for mat quality maternal and newborn care. And the core components, you probably can't see very well of this, I'm afraid, didn't come through well in the, the presentation, was that the core components of this framework were effective practices, organisation of care, values, philosophy, and the characteristics of care providers. So when we were considering the findings of the studies, we considered them around all these different domains. So it wasn't just what should be done, you know, the different practices, you know, should someone at risk of shoulder dystocia have a cesarean section, it was also how should the care be provided in regard to organisation and who should be the person providing it? Should it be a midwife or an obstetrician? So once we had our generic protocol, we then tailored it for each individual review to make these individual protocols. And these were developed in conjunction with um, our review sponsors. So they help provide guidance on the inclusion exclusion criteria. And also, if we were struggling to find highly processed evidence, they would kind of make sure we weren't missing out any key papers in the area that they were aware of. So you won't be able to see it very well, unfortunately, in this slide. But this is an example of one of the, the protocols. I think it was for the, the neonatal review. So you can see here, it's, it's fairly brief, really. You've got our... Um, our questions and objectives, what sort of studies we're including, um, intervention types, you know, our, our eligibility criteria, our approach to critical appraisal, how we're actually going to search the literature. And I'll, I'll talk through that a bit now. Yeah, so after developing the eligibility criteria, we obviously had to do our searches. We had to do them quickly. And as I said before, we used a hierarchical approach. So when we were looking for kind of specific bits around effectiveness, you know, for an example would be for the continuity of care model and um, midwifery, of, sorry, midwifery models of continuity care are a big thing in maternity care. Um, and we started with the, the Cochrane Library for anything around effectiveness. If there weren't Cochrane reviews available, then we did a highly focused search to find relevant systematic reviews in core databases, so Medline, CINAHL. Um, as the review, as I said before, had to take into account views and experiences of families, we looked um, for metasyntheses as well, which would address the kind of more qualitative questions. And Obviously, doing that sort of searching, you could get hundreds, thousands of records that would need screened. We did apply systematic review search filters to um, limit the searches. And again, it's not ideal, but to preserve efficiency, only one person was involved in the study selection, you know, the screening of titles, etc. But we did regularly consult with each other um, to discuss the application of the inclusion criteria if there was nothing we were, if there was anything we were unsure on. In addition, we also looked at all the kind of relevant clinical guidelines produced by NICE, SIGN, and um, you know professional organisations such as the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. You may, may or not may or may not be aware, but they produced their green top guidelines, which are all underpinned by systematic reviews. So they were a very good source of um, knowledge for us. Royal College of Midwives as well. We searched all of that. And then if we still couldn't get the answers we were looking for, we searched the reference lists of non-systematic reviews as well to look for any primary studies and consulted with the review groups too to see if they were aware of um, 
key primary studies in this area. This was, I think, particularly crucial with the neonatal work. There weren't many relevant neonatal systematic reviews, um, but thankfully the the review sponsors for that who were clinicians in the area were also very research engaged. They were able to give us um, key papers in that. So yeah, this just kind of I think summarizes what I was just saying in the, the last slide as well there. So I'll move on. Um, yeah, so again, this is just summarizing. So yeah, for the, the neonatal review, we found that there really wasn't any good quality systematic review evidence. There were some systematic reviews that were out there, but they were poorly conducted, so we didn't feel we could rely on them. Um, and a lack of studies as well. But we we when we spoke with the review sponsors, we were able to identify nine high quality studies, which looked at the impact of place of birth. Um, for a preterm and low birth weight babies. So that was more around should um, preterm babies be bought, where, sorry, were their outcomes better if they were born in a level three unit versus a level one unit. Level three has got the very high levels of NICU care. The problem with them is they need to have enough babies going into them to be able to deliver effective care because it's, it's very highly specialised. So this became quite a contentious area because um, you know, the third sector organisations thinks people don't want neonatal units being closed down, but actually the evidence suggests that your baby might have a better outcome if it goes to a high volume unit. So after we got the, the literature, the, the next stage was around the analysis and the kind of data extraction. So again, to maintain efficiency, extraction was conducted by just one of us. And again, we consulted the, the team for discussion as needed. And then we assessed quality using the, the nice quality assessment checklists, which were relatively quick to apply. And the results of all our included reviews and where appropriate studies were then mapped to this framework for quality maternal and neonatal care. Um, primary studies were analysed separately and we made that clear when um, evidence came from primary studies versus from systematic reviews. Um, we then, once we'd kind of had a first go at, at, at mapping the results, we would give them to the, the relevant review groups and they would be given a draft of the review and asked if they were felt any key studies were missing and if they agreed with the interpretation of the results. Um, so hopefully these the findings reflected a range of stakeholders' views as well. Um, and then once we'd fin finalised this process, we worked with the review sponsors to develop recommendations that were policy relevant and aligned to the components of the framework. And we also worked closely with some civil servants too, um, who were attached to this review to again make sure it was all in a language that made sense to them. So kind of key to this was um, developing what we called top sheets. You know, the reviews themselves, unsurprisingly, ended up being fairly lengthy, you know, 40 pages long. So we knew that the policymakers were unlikely to read the full um, documents. So we developed these kind of one to two page summaries, which contained what a, a brief description of what evidence we found, you know, was it systematic reviews? Was it primary studies? How many studies were in the reviews? Um, you know, how certain were we in the evidence, the key findings and the, the recommendations? And these, again, we kept them mapped to this quality maternal and newborn care framework around principles, organisation of care and care providers. So obviously we had a number of limitations in this piece of work. You know, it was a, a fairly short period of time that we had to complete the work in. So we did have to strike a balance between rigour and timeliness. So we made a number of, of trade-offs. You know, first of all, the search was highly focused. We may well have missed papers. And um, we had one person just doing the study selection and data extraction that can obviously be influenced by biases and subject to mistakes, particularly when you're doing it quickly. Um, and we also used the NICE critical appraisal tool to look at systematic reviews. Arguably, there are tools such as Robus, which would probably be more robust, but we did find more time consuming to implement. 
Um, that being said, we feel that we had a number of safeguards in place, so we feel that it's unlikely that the broad conclusions would greatly differ had we done full systematic reviews on this. You know, we had multiple checks, so even if the review was incomplete, I think we were confident that it was unlikely to be wrong or harmful. You know, we were making sure we were asking the right questions, you know, that it would be helpful for the policymakers. Um, we used this hierarchical approach to the searches. So even if we couldn't find good quality systematic review evidence, we were trying to find something that was, was quality. Um, and we had the narrative synthesis, you know, sense checked by other members of the review team, but also um, service users and other stakeholders. We did make sure the evidence was appraised and we hopefully made it that policymakers could understand what we were actually saying. So in the end, I think back in 2017, the Scottish Government did publish their, um, it was called Best Start, the Review of Maternity and Neonatal Services for Scotland. Um, they could have chosen to ignore everything that we said, but I'm pleased to say that they, they did take into account a lot of our recommendations, at least in this policy document. Um, and one of the big things that came out of it was around, you know, advocating for a continuity model of midwifery care, whereby all women see the same midwife throughout pregnancy. Ideally, they would see them in labour and then postnatally too. There were, prior to this review, there were pockets of this in Scotland, not necessarily so much the labour care, but certainly the antenatal care and the um, postnatal care. Unfortunately, COVID then came along and kind of stomped on all of that. Um, and we're kind of not back to square one, but um, kind of continuity of care and things were, were put by the wayside a bit with, with COVID. But thankfully, I think things are maybe slowly getting better, but obviously we need further evaluation to, to look at that. So that, that's where we are with that. Um, as I said at the start, we used a kind of adapted but similar approach for some work we did with the Nursing and Midwifery Council. That was more around education for midwifery students. Um, and then we're now looking at, again, using this approach for uh, a further review in maternity care. And just like to thank all these people. There was huge numbers of people involved in this review, but these without these specific people, we really couldn't have um, managed uh, without them. So thank you to all of them. And thanks for listening. We wrote this up as a paper as well, if anyone's interested. Um, so you can see all the, the steps of the review there. So do you want me to stop sharing now? Yes, if you can. Well, thank you very much. That was really interesting. Um, I, I I think that was absolutely brilliant because you showed kind of the workings behind the themes really nicely, I think. So I found that absolutely um, engaging because I could see all the work that goes into this review behind the scenes when often it can be the situation of where researchers will think, oh, well, we'll rapidly rush this bit because it's a rapid review. Mm -hmm. But you've shown that it might be rapid, but there's a lot going on there. Yeah, and a lot of so, the thinking was done at the start. So I think particularly the civil service thing's got a bit like, mm, why is this taking so long? But actually, we needed to do that. And then that meant the actual bringing together of the evidence, because we knew how we were going to do it, we could do relatively quickly. Fantastic. So yeah, that that is something which here in Lancaster, a lot of uh, researchers are told you need perfect preparation in order to actually perform yeah. because otherwise yeah you'll never quite be as effective and as quick if you don't spend a lot of time at the beginning thinking yeah so yeah absolutely brilliant so we've got some questions so I'm just going to have a look at our questions now I bring these in I do get more myself as well which I I do get <laughs> as comparing which is brilliant but I've noticed somebody has already asked it um and my question would definitely be and it's also been asked here by let's say by uh Kerry and that's about grey literature mm. so yes and where did grey literature factor into your final product did you use it and how did you integrate it that's a really good question 
we didn't really use it. That would be one of the omissions beyond, I guess, like these reports from like the Royal College of Obstetricians. It was a big, a very helpful piece of work. I think, as I said, they make these green top guidelines, which are all based on evidence synthesis. But no, we didn't go to, you know, my normal sources for great literature and maternal health care would be, you know, UNICEF, um, things like that. We we didn't go there um, because of the time frame. But that, that would be a, a gap in it too, absolutely. Would it, would it be something you would consider in the future if you had uh, more time? Um, yes, I guess it, it would. Um, I mean, my knowledge of the field now, I mean, as I was done five years ago, at that point, I was just kind of getting into maternal and infant health. I am in it more now, so I would probably know the key papers in the grey literature to bring into it, which would help. Um, yeah, but yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and my other question to this as well was, did you consider, for instance, searching through countries not from the UK? For instance, was it only focused on the UK, but was it more of a worldwide search? It was more of a worldwide search, I guess, in that we didn't put specific country limitations on it and we were looking at systematic review level evidence. So within the reviews, the studies could be from any country, tended to probably be more from the US and obviously some of that is just not relevant around the kind of a big focus obviously was on who delivers the care um, and you know whether that was midwife led or or consultant led um, there's a relatively small number of countries I guess where care is often midwife led so that would be limited to those countries you know namely the UK um, some handful of European countries and Australia. So I guess in a sense that limited the literature a bit, but we certainly didn't exclude anything, but we probably always would have had in the back of our mind, is this relevant for a, a UK setting? Um, so you you would you would say not to consider, you know, language limit, uh, sorry, um, country based limitations are not suitable. You'd always go for, you know, not limiting by language, not limiting yeah, by Yeah, and it, it's really interesting because I've just finished a big piece of work on breastfeeding support and the focus of that was very much on developing um, breastfeeding support for the NHS and we did you know an update of the Cochrane Review on breastfeeding support which had I mean is biased towards high income countries but again a lot of high income country studies are not relevant uh, or have issues you know particularly around the US in terms of how maternity services are delivered but we did a lot of stakeholder engagement for this work and one of the things we were going to consider in terms of our implementation recommendations was limiting it to specific countries that were relevant to the UK but when we spoke with stakeholders they didn't think we could actually make that sort of categorization uh, which I found quite interesting so I think yes I probably wouldn't be ex excluding on the basis of um, country but again the things around like neonatal care like your tertiary level three units you're probably only going to get in more high income countries too so the it's probably more is our evidence useful in other countries what we okay. get is probably relevant yeah thank you thank you so Kerry has also got another very good question so she got in early so um so what we have here is um, were health librarians involved in either the sponsorship, searching or synthesis processes? Sorry, can I, you repeat that? Oh, so I've got it's up here. So were health librarians involved? Oh, health in librarians. Yes. No, that that's a really interesting one. So where I worked before, we had an amazing librarian and I certainly would have been getting her involved. Um, here, I find that we can get support. But the support tends to be, I don't I don't want to put this in a, a mean way because they really are working very hard. But very much ha helping undergraduates find relevant literature rather than systematic review type levels of searches. So, no, we didn't. But had yeah. we had an information specialist 
I definitely would have been going to them. Yes, I wish we had, but we don't have anybody here. We've been petitioning for that, but we don't have that. Okay. Super, so that fantastic. Fortunately, Louise, who normally do this, is now from the next start next month, will be our information specialist here, working with systematic reviews, which is fantastic news. So, um, other things we have here, how did you ensure that the relevant evidence found was relevant to Scotland, so geographically? Yeah, so I guess that was probably where working with the stakeholders was was really key. Um, again, yeah, because as I was saying, some of this stuff, the way the particular services are delivered in the US is not always relevant here. A good example would be around um, services for women from vulnerable groups. So um, there is a, a big intervention here in Scotland. I think you have it in England too, family nurse partnership, strong evidence from the US that it is effective. Um, studies have now been done in the UK, which show maybe some small improvements for some secondary outcomes, but not major benefits. Um, but it's kind of the Scottish government's baby, this, this family nurse part partnership. But the reason we don't think it's particularly effective here is in the US, women from the most vulnerable groups will not be getting any maternity care, whereas here all women do get, thankfully, get a midwife. Um, so you're not really comparing like with like. So we did kind of have to caution it in a way that, you know, okay, well, we said, look, there is evidence that shows this family nurse partner partnership in the US is, is effective, but actually the evidence from the UK shows it's not so effective and the reason that we think that is because we already have a kind of base level of of care here so that was that was one way we did it um was trying to think of the applicability and yeah really speaking with the stakeholders i think was was key as well thank you uh we've got one question actually from two different people um from katharina and uh, I, I, sorry if I say your name wrong, it's come in slightly different. It's Shalia, maybe. Uh, so we did time-based questions. So mm. uh, how long did the process take from start to finish? Mm. Did it include discussions about payment, how it's going to be um, paid for, um, who's, who's paying for what? And what was the split? You know, what was the time spent in between, say, protocol development and the review himself? Oh, that's a good question. I'm trying to trying to think back to that. So originally we were given kind of four to five months to do it all. I think it was probably till when they were really finalised, there was a wee bit of a tail end. We were probably more like eight months, but the drafts were all done by about six months, I would say. But yeah, the first few months were really spent, you know, teasing out these questions and these protocols. That took a good two months, I would say, to get that done and finalised. Because as well, we were having to go to these meetings and getting them arranged. They were monthly meetings. So um, sometimes you were delayed a bit having to wait for the next meetings. But I was essentially working on it full time for six to eight months. And um, we did get money from the Scottish government to do it. So that enabled that. Um, I think also helped that at that point, I was a postdoc. So I didn't have other commitments. It would be really hard to do that now. I couldn't just drop everything for six to eight months as a lecturer because you've got your teaching and everything. Um, but I was on a kind of core funded job from the university to kind of develop evidence synthesis at that point. So that that was really helpful and allowed that. So, yeah, I was on it full time and then the other academic staff were able to, I don't know, I guess they were on it for about a day or so a week. We did get money. I think it was about 60,000. It no, no, it couldn't have been that much. It certainly wasn't enough. You know, if you'd fully economically costed it, it didn't cover it all, but it was enough to make the university happy. That's super. That, so that, again, that's really interesting because yeah. systematic reviews as a large object, you can kind of benchmark, benchmark them quite easy. Well, yeah. not necessarily easily, but 
it's much more of a known entity. But when yeah. you're talking about more rapid reviews, and you say rapid, people can yeah. say, oh, a week, two years. Yeah. It's very interesting. So being able to say this is how long a rapid review will take and then saying you're still looking at a year, possibly, or yeah. even longer. Uh, yeah. I mean, I guess had we just had to do maternity or neonatal, it would have been done, I guess, in a couple of months. We had seven reviews in total that took us about, I suppose, a month. You could then argue a month per review on average. Brilliant. Okay, super. Thank you. And we have one last question. It's a bit of a, 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 a shorter one, um, but we've probably all experienced this. And did you find that a lot of systematic reviews were indicating more research was needed? And yes. is this really frustrating? Yes, it is. With you? When you're on the other end, I know, and you know, it seems you're kind of pushed to do that. You know, I've just finished a Cochrane review and it was very much, you need to like just make that the conclusion, even though there is evidence to support it. Um, and you can see why policymakers probably get really fed up of that, you know, just saying we need more evidence, we need more research in this area. Yes, that, that did happen. I mean, there were areas where it was fairly clear like the, the continuity models of care and um, you know there is fairly pretty strong evidence that outcomes are better but also women prefer it the midwives actually prefer it too again with the NICU stuff and um, the level three evidence being more effective for for sorry the level three units being more effective for newborns was was pretty clear too the difficulty with that is it went against what the public want which is everybody wants a level three NICU in, in their city because they don't want to have to travel three hours to to be where their baby is, which you can understand. Um, so it's the, the task for the government there is trying to pitch it. Well, actually, your baby's probably more likely going to survive if it's in the, the highly specialised unit three hours away. Super. So thank you for that. That was the last question. Sorry to put you on the spot a little bit, but you know, oh, there was a okay. lot of fantastic questions. Yes, no, thank, thank you for having me. Oh, yeah. So thank you very much for coming. Um, oh, and um, what we'll do is um, I just posted in the chat a feedback form. So please offer any feedback for your session. Um, just to say, we uh, this was the last systematic review for the year. But a little bit of a sales pitch. If you're not following the library on Twitter, you're not um, keeping in touch with us, please do, because uh, next year's sessions will be another jam-packed um, programme of uh, systematic review, peer reviewing, uh, subjects on uh, liaison between systematic reviewers, uh, researchers, open research, basically every single topic you might be interested in. So I'm sure that if you've been following our systematic review series this year, you'll find something in next Yes, uh, program to interest you. Um, and again, thank you very much for Anna for coming. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, if you want to say thank you, please um, turn your uh, cameras on and say thank you very much. And we look forward to um, the next Systematic View uh, Conversation series. And thank you for coming to the previous years. Thank you so much for having me.